here uh, after the whole day of the second day of the conference. Uh, this should be very quick. I just would like to invite you for the next PyData Prague meetup, uh, which will happen <laughs> shockingly in Prague. So I guess you know the mission of the PyData. So uh, it's basically about data science, Python, and everything around it. And so if you will be at a time in Prague, you are most definitely welcome. It will happen on the 18th of October in LMC. That's actually a company I come from. We have a tea room here. I hope you enjoy the tea. So uh, we have a tea room also in the office. So if you will come to the meetup, there will be some. And as well as some alcohol and soft drinks and a lot of food. And as well, uh, very nice talks. For example, uh, first speaker who is confirmed already will be from Rossum, if I remember correctly. And it will be about uh, machine translations. So this is about a meetup. I would like to say also that we already had like uh, 11 meetups before the COVID and during the COVID and after the COVID. Here are some pictures from the latest meetups. It was very nice. It happened shocking again in Prague. And we have uh, a lot of accounts on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. So check it out. And uh, meetup RSVP is on meetup.com. So if you want to come there, just register and Come. Yeah, sure. We are still looking for one speaker, so you can you can uh, be one of uh, you can be that that guy or a girl. And the last thing, we have a YouTube channel full of uh, videos from uh, from uh, the other meetups. So check it out. Uh, you can find it just if you write PyData Prague. It's under the PyData channel in general. So this is it, and do you have any questions about our little community? Where is it? <laughs> Thank you, guys. Uh, this presentation will be in Slovak language, but the slides are in English, so I'm sorry, but we are talking about the Slovak community, cloud native community, almost about Kubernetes. So at first, I would like to talk about what is uh, Cloud Nating Computing Foundation. Cloud Nating Computing Foundation is a, uh, yeah, CERSCO Organizatio Linux Computing Foundation. A je to v podstate neziskové združenie, ktoré spája open sourceové projekty, nadšencov a spoločnosti spoločne na jednom neutrálnom mieste. Tu mám Cloud Native Computing definíciu, je to také trošku zložité, alebo vyzerá to dosť tak ako strašidelne, ale chcel by som tam upozoriť na jednu vec, čo tam nehovorí sa o čom, a to je Kubernetes ako taký. Kubernetes, ktorý je ako kľúčová technológia v Cloud Native Computing, Uh, nie je súčasťou tejto definície. Hovorí sa tu všetko o mikroservisoch, o immutable infrastructure a o rôznych ďalších veciach, ako deklaratívnych apinách. Chcel by som pár slov o tom, že kto sme a čo robíme. Takže sme Združenie pre podporu cloud native technológií. Máme na to neziskové občianské združenie, ktoré organizuje pravidelné meetupy, na ktoré by som vás potom aj v závere chcel pozvať. Čo sme, alebo ako už v podstate momentálne fungujeme, sme na trhu viac ako 3 roky. Máme viac ako 400 členov momentálne už na, na meetup.com. Mali sme viac ako 1700 ľudí na našich meetupoch a máme veľmi veľa fanúšikov na Facebooku alebo aj na, na ostatných médiách. A tiež na nejaký taký priemerný meetup chodí povedzme od tých 30 do tých 50-60 ľudí. A už sme v podstate spravili momentálne viac ako 30 meetupov a jednu konferenciu. Toto bola konferencia, ktorú sme robili tento rok. Je to konferencia Kubernetes Community Days Czech and Slovak. Bola to virtuálna konferencia a uskutočnila sa v apríli. Tiež niekedy ešte nemáme na momentálne na plánu, ale budúci rok by sme chceli urobiť pokračovanie, pravdepodobne už vo fyzickom prostredí. Celá naša v podstate fungovanie a organizácia je k dispozícii na Facebooku alebo na YouTube channel, kde máme naše videá, všetky dispozícii sú tam nahrané aj prezentácie, aj záznamy, videozáznamy. 
Aktuálne sme prechádzali s meetupkom na community CNCF.io lomeno Bratislava, takže keby sa niekto chcel pripojiť alebo zapojiť do našej komunity, môže si načítať tento QR kód alebo naštíviť urelečku a tam si prikliknúť a dá sa potom bez problémov prihlásiť na naše meetupy. Máme tiež aj samostatný Slack kanál, kde je viac ako 300 ľudí momentálne už prihlásených, takže pokiaľ by chcel niekto komunikovať alebo mal nejaký problém s prevádzkou, tak ako kľudne sa môže prihlásiť. Dobre, takže toto sú nejaké naše komunity, kde fungujeme. To je v podstate, jak som vravil, to community CNC v I.O. lomeno Bratislava, Facebook alebo ten Slack. Čo teraz najbližšie plánujeme, takže toto je nejaký taký harmonogram našich aktivít. Tu by som chcel dať ukázať, že sme v podstate pomerne aktívni. Snažíme sa robiť pravidelne meetupy. Najbližšie budeme mať teraz v septembri ešte meetup ohľadne observability and analysis a monitoringu. Ďalší mesiac bude o management tooloch sa budeme baviť. Potom v novembri by sme sa chceli baviť o bermetale a hlavne o ARM procesoroch. Vždycky z VIEV robíme tak dvakrát do roka aj také neformálne meetupy. Jeden býva v júni, v júli a druhý býva v decembri. To bývajú buď nejaké také ako pivo alebo nejaké tieto vianočné trhy. No a ešte potom v tom januári by sme chceli robiť Kubernetes operátorov. Dobre, to bolo z mojej strany všetko teda, takže ak ma niekto záujem sa zapojiť do komunity alebo sa dozvedieť viac, tak si ma kľudne odchyťte. Rád poviem nejaké podrobnosti alebo čo bude treba. Ďakujem zatiaľ za pozornosť. After a fierce discussion with uh, my colleagues, uh, I have a question for you. How often do you leave your mobile device at home? <laughs> When you're leaving, of course. Uh, I guess not very often. And the other question is, yeah. what do you mostly do when you're looking at your screen? Like, I have to confess, that's mine. But just let's face it, we are all addicts, or almost all, I will not partialize it that, that much. Uh, we feel almost constantly the urge to play with those little devices and check and interact and swipe uh, a lot. Um, and it seems that it's here to stay with us because the dopamine shots we, ha we get from it is just, it, it's really hard to beat. So, We can still play with those devices and wait for those likes uh, under the new photos we posted on Instagram or some other favorite social uh, network. Or we can erase the blank points from the maps. We still have them in 2022. This is a topic uh, related to, to, to the yesterday's talk, so I wanted to do a quick follow-up uh, on one yet another possibility how to uh, contribute to open source and this is map swipe um, uh, so the uh, idea behind the map swipe is that it's in a mobile app you can install it on your mobile uh, through the quests uh, through some gamification uh, techniques tapping and sw and swiping Uh, it helps to respond uh, in the places of the world uh, where crises are most probable to happen, uh, where the uh, first uh, response team needs need to get on time to the people that live somewhere where the maps are not yet built. Uh, so you can be the hero and the adventurer at the same time. You can save people uh, by increasing their visibility and the maps. Uh, the idea is quite simple. You can choose your mission. You can choose the geo you want to uh, focus on. And then you get the quest. You can either uh, find buildings or roads or waterways or some other quests I don't know about. Then you tap when you spot the uh, building or the, the goal of your uh, activity. Uh, if you can't spot anything, because the clouds, for example, uh, cover the uh, imagery, then you just tap three times and it's red. So basically they use the system of flagging like green, uh, yellow, red. Uh, quite intuitive, I'd say. Oops, sorry. Uh, 
So this is a, um, an application that's open sourced. Uh, its source code is hosted on GitHub. Uh, I mentioned it uh, on Python SK also because the backend of the application is written in Python. So uh, you can contribute to the maps either by downloading and mapping and helping the uh, teams out there, or uh, you can also contribute to the source code uh, work it. So I'd say grab it, do it, while waiting for those likes. Thank you very much. So hi guys, I will be today talking about cool things you can do with ClickHouse. So let's start with some history. ClickHouse is uh, all of database that was de uh, built in Yandex, that is something like Google, but in Russia, and they use it in their Yandex Metrica. Luckily, it's open source, so nothing to worry. And uh, also, it has like built a really, really big community in the uh, all around the world. Uh, so what they use ClickHouse is basically Yandex Metrica, which is uh, basically something like Google Analytics. So it tracks users, uh, what they do on the websites, and then it's uh, like processing in the back and displaying it like Google Analytics, basically. So why do they actually need this uh, ClickHouse? And they don't use something like MySQL or another relational database. So basically, this is column-oriented database, so it's built for like big data ingestion, like gigabytes per second per server. Uh, it can uh, process these data like really fast. It can uh, do aggregations and stuff like that. But the drawback is that these data are mostly in immutable. Uh, also, it provides uh, time-oriented features like window views, so you can count, you can calculate like aggregations for past 10 seconds and stuff like that. And other databases like MySQL or MongoDB are really not suitable for stuff like that. So, we can okay. go. And one of the beautiful use cases of ClickHouse is a plausible, which is a sort of alternative for Google Analytics, or they call it lightweight because like 45 times smaller. Um, so it's open source still for tracking your website traffic. And it's fully compliant with privacy regulations like in Europe, also in America. Um, because how it's working, it's uh, hashing basically everything about you. It's not providing any session ID from the cookies or anything. So it starts tracking the moment you actually enter your website. And uh, it's anonymizing everything based on your domain, from the device you joined, also what time you actually join. And like every 24 hours, this is recalculated, so you don't have to be worrying about. Um, they have several, like even the plausible has a lot of use cases, for example, you can uh, do A-B tests on your website um, with the data that you collect from Plausible, or within the marketing, you can use UTM tags to track your ads, email, social media posts, so basically you can track when, how many participants, are, or like, for example, with Slido, how many participants joined from Slido, the type really in just into the browser, or how many people came from Facebook or Google, and we have, I'll show you some beautiful graphs later on. Or you can set your own goals as well. For example, you want to see how many people click on a certain button, like whether they prefer this way or that way. So as I said already, uh, see the test. OK, so if they're not collecting your personal data, what data is actually collected? So as I mentioned, source of visit, so where you came from, when did this happen? If you, for example, set up cookies, so like you can join, use Plausible with uh, Bloomreach, or ex former Exponea, and also Google Analytics at the same time. So then you're collecting different data, but it's another talk. Um, so you can grant like what consent you gave. So you can say there's a personal goal, like did you give them just analytic consent or the consent to collect all the data. You can track the time spent on the page, uh, the entry page, exit page, so where did they go after they visited your page, uh, custom clicks, country, operating system, device, or even a browser. Um, so these are some nice they also provide you with dashboard uh, where you start. Uh, you can see, for example, page visits on one of the sliders page. Like you can see the total number in the day. It was 121. It was today just one of the random pages. Uh, number of unique visitors because obviously like within the 24 hours, I can decide that I would open Slido 
twice at least. And there you can see also the sources and different devices. So like for us, it's important to see whether you came from a mobile so like we can uh, decide what to optimize better. So I guess thank you for everything. And that's it. Hello, uh, my name is Christian. Maybe uh, you remember me from my lighting talk yesterday. So I wanted to give a talk about a different topic. So while I was preparing that, uh, those slides, I must confess it's the first time that I'm in Slovakia and uh, I didn't know anything about the country, anything. <clears throat> I am from South America, and for me, like geography in Europe, still like a mystery. Sometimes, like, oh, there is that country. And I was uh, when I was even putting the flag on this little map that I showed at the beginning, I was like Google like four times, like just to be 100% sure it was the recent flag. It was like no political like messages, whatever, because I didn't want to mess it up, right? So I started to think, what do we have in common? Like you, like people from Slovakia, and myself, like from South America. And then I thought about Python. You remember Miro's talk about like the, how complicated names are. I suffer with them myself in Germany and everything. Like with, I have an accent on the A, so it's not Christian. It's Christian. I'm not Christian as well, but whatever. And then what do we have in common? Like we need to learn English to interact with the other people in tech, right? So I was really happy because a long time ago, with a group of people, we decided to start translating the documentation of Python to Spanish. And if you're not aware, we are, of course, uh, we have better position there because there is the list of all the countries that speak Spanish. So a lot of people. It was really fun. And uh, yeah, I mean, we had a little repository here uh, with many contributions. And they, even someone did a graphic there with all the names of people con contributing to stuff. <clears throat> so I say, cool. So I will look this Slovak version of, and there was nothing. So I said, how can I motivate this, the, the community in Slovakia to start, you know, digging more into Python stuff? So then I remember the talk by Peter yesterday that uh, he briefly mentioned some unspoken version of Python. And I decided to go to the repo, <clears throat> uh, see Python, I compile it myself. So here, well, you can see that, uh, I have a typical Python binary, and I compiled the latest version from the from the C Python repository that you all are aware of. And I execute it. <clears throat> and then I noticed that there was something weird already. <laughs> so I decided to say, hmm, okay, well, this is Python. So as you know, Python is a calculator. Yes, we can do math. <clears throat> you can also check for things, like for example, how do you check if a, a variable is a string? Like how do we check if S is a string? So if you are a good programmer, it's like I am. Do you know that you can check it like this, right? So then if you have <coughs> this, this is, this is valid Python code, you can try it. Uh, and there are many other things, like there. how do you check, for example, like if a um, number is a power of two? It's really simple. So let's say you have a number, and then of course, you know you need to use the way of defining like, you know, bitwise operation. And then if you have like, for example, a number that is not a power of two, and check it as well, right? So I said, okay, well, whatever, everything seems fine for me, like everything is Python. And then I see a, a little help, sorry, I did a deer of the things that we have in this here. And then I noticed <coughs> that it was a special translate function. So I said, okay, translate, why don't we put it there? Oh, you cannot see it, oh, I'm really sorry. So maybe there, using the country code. Okay, fair enough, so I said, okay, translate. And then that weird thing started to happen, right? And then, okay, fair enough. And I was completely new. So this morning, I started to open all the Google Translate dictionaries. I started to ask a few people around, maybe you asked me, like, what is the equivalent? How can I say this in Python? And then I say, okay, well, whatever. So first of all, I have one minute left. So how do you check if an element is in a list? If this is in the list, how do you check it? With Exactly. <laughs> what do you check if, if this is not on the list? Of course. <laughs> and then you can do even more nice things. Like I said, okay, well, I love for loops in general. So I said, okay, let's write a for loop, all right? So I said, okay, so. <laughs> and then you can say, I don't know, like you can check if something like that. And since I don't have this, I remember that I put this here. So maybe it's the... 
And then you can have parallel numbers here. <laughs> so if you are interested in this, yesterday you couldn't see my social uh, information, media, whatever. So this is my name. You can find me then on social media there if you want to know the patches that I did. Yes, write me up. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Danny, and I'm from Italy. And for this reason, uh, today I'm talking to you about how to make pizza <laughs> with Python and Django. Uh, well, you can start creating an object called uh, pizza with flour, white flour. Then you can add uh, uh, olive oil. You can add uh, tomato sauce. And then you need to add toppings. Well, maybe another kind of toppings. Don't try this, please. <laughs> so maybe you want to roll back our last instruction and update with the uh, proper toppings. <laughs> How you can do it using maybe Django version for Django and is an extension uh, to the Django web framework that provides version control for model instances you can roll back at any point in a model uh, instance history. You can recover the latest record uh, in model instances and uh, all of this with a simple admin integration. You can install it using pip, add reversion to installed apps in Django settings, and run the first migration. You can integrate into your admin like this, registering uh, the pizza model extending version admin. And in the admin page, you can see a nice recover button in the model list. And in the change page, you can see the history button. You can register your models for reversion and using reversion API, like this one, just registering everything or just single fields. And so you can roll back your pizza object to a previous version. You can update uh, your toppings using a proper toppings, please. And you can bake your pizza. What about Django REST framework? Well, if you want to integrate Django version in REST framework, you can use this package I made myself a few months ago. You can add to middlewares in reversion. And you can register your model in the same way and extending your model view set using history model view sets or other mixing you can see in the documentation. You have a, a couple of endpoints like history endpoint, uh, deleted and revert for listing your history, uh, deleted records and reverting an object. Here's the mix scenes. And that's it. Thank you, Arthur, for suggesting me this talk. And these are the links if you want to follow back. Uh, hi. Um, yesterday, I had a presentation about uh, creating maps in Folium. And after that presentation, uh, I was approached by one of you asking, how did you make those slides? And it was sort of apparent that those slides are from a Jupyter Notebook, so I wanted to show you here now how to convert a Jupyter Notebook into a slide deck. And let me, it's very brief, so I will spend a bit seconds with interaction, interacting with you. How many of you work in Jupyter Slides, at least occasionally? Could you raise your hand? Uh -huh. So I hope it will be interesting for everyone, although I guess just half of the people say they find this uh, f find this uh, environment uh, familiar. So basically, look, you can take a Jupyter notebook and convert it into HTML document. Notice that there is this there, there is this arrow here. So if I click on right, I get to section basics. Basically, one slide is one or more cells in the Jupyter, and you must set that cell how it should be rendered. So I set a cell which contains text section one basics to slide and 
you see another arrow here. So if I go to right, I go to another slide. And if I go to back, there is an also arrow down, uh, which says uh, subslide. So the other type of cell you can have is a subslide. It can contain a code, it can contain markdown. So this is how it looks like. And now I go to the Jupyter Notebook to show you how to get this, right? So that's the Jupyter Notebook. You remember that very first slide was intro slide deck for the lightning talk. And that's my first, uh, first cell here. Then this is another cell, another cell, and another cell. How do I say what, which of them should be the main slide and which of them should be the sub-slide, so the one that you go to below? Well, now the thing that you should learn if you want to do this, you must go to this view, cell toolbar, and activate slideshow. See the difference? Here I got these drop-downs, slide type. And back to that presentation, if I want to have the main slide, I select slide. This is another main slide, slide, and this is a sub-slide. So what's the difference? Main slide has no like sub-chapter. This is the, the first slide of a chapter. This is another main slide, and if I go down, I want to really like develop that chapter, it, it's a sub-slide, that, that's the entire magic. Uh, there are also uh, cells which you can suppress. If you have some password here, you say skip, and yeah, that's it. And how to get it? So I noted it down for you. You either do it through this, uh, through this inter um, graphic way, download as, you see it here, right? Reveal JS slides. Or if you come with some extra uh, requirements, like I want to use another template, I want to suppress the code, or vice versa, I want only show the code and not the outputs, then you can access these slides through, through a command line. The command is simply Jupyter NB convert notebook name to slides and options. And I also prepared an example of that. So I am in that directory with slides from Jupyter Lightning Talk IP notebook. Now I run this thing, this Jupyter NB convert. Are you able to read it? Or I just read, well, so it's Jupyter NB convert what notebook to convert, and then parameters. One of them is two slides, and the other ones would be like suppress code or whatever template you want to use. I click on that, a moment of magic now, and it tells me, yeah, this notebook was converted to slides. So if I list the content of, of the directory, you see there is HTML there. If I go there, yeah, this is the brand new thing, which you have seen beforehand. So that's it, really to wrap it, activate these options for slide type here in view, and then either download or go through a through, uh, command line. Can we have multiple cells on one slide? Yes, let's talk about it. It's called fragment, actually. So uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Elena Osipova. I'm the and Tech Community Manager at Kiwi.com. And by my job description, I work with uh, developers, and I listen a lot about all the projects our developers are working on. The developer wrote an open source library that we decided to use instead of existing solution or our auto-booking tribe for migrating to Kamunda workflow engine, and it was epic. So I, I, I'm hearing a lot of stories, and I'm proposing them to go public with it, to go visible with it. And imposter syndrome kicks in, and they are starting to tell me this. I'm not skilled enough. I, I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not ready to go public. I'm not ready for public speaking. Can you relate to this? Yes? <laughs> OK. And it can be even funnier. Oh, sorry. OK, so yeah, it can be even more interesting. Like, I have no interesting topics. My size of the merch is like too small after pandemics. So yeah, imposter, imposter syndrome. But I want to tell you one thing. You are not the first one to talk about this, and it's fine. Your topic cannot be like 100% fresh, but your point of view, your, your opinion can be really valuable for the community. 
Uh, and strong personal brand can also lead you to more interesting projects, to more valuable connections and great, great people, and even better salary, actually, and new role. So before you start working on a personal brand, try to define who you are. Uh, you can first try to ask your friends and colleagues who do you think uh, who do they think you are? You will hear a lot of interesting, exciting stuff about yourself and surprising. Or you can also check out uh, this thing by Carl Jung, which is uh, using a lot, in, uh, which is used a lot in branding. And you can try to think if you are a trickster or lover or uh, explorer. It's really interesting. I cannot cover it. Uh, I cannot cover this thing, thing now during my lightning. But just check it out by yourself. Just Google it. Uh, you should set your goal. Just try to think if you want to work on a personal brand for getting a new job or better salary or just meet new people or promote your project. Just set, set up the clear goal and start working. And uh, this PyCon Slovakia is really a nice time to do so. Uh, grow your network, talk to people. Most likely today a lot of people will be going for beers. Just find us in code Kiwi.com t-shirts. We will be talking to people a lot. Uh, write an article, start your own blog, uh, apply to talk at the conference, next PyCon Slovakia or EuroPython, join local Python user groups, they constantly looking for fresh faces. Be on social media, Twitter works perfectly for tech people, you can follow me, you can follow other people, I met a lot of people there and it's amazing. Or you can also use LinkedIn, but I'm not a big fan. Uh, Create content, contribute to open source. I think Carolina presented great project today and Hectoberfest is ahead of us. Find support to grow as a public speaker, find a mentor, ask your DevRel person or tech community manager or just peers, and they will definitely help you to get to your first meetup or a conference. Be authentic, do what you love, do what you are passionate about, and I don't know, I'm pretty sure it's gonna be fun. If you want to connect and talk more about tech community building, Python, I'm here at Twitter and have a nice conference. Hello, I'm Thomas and I'm going to tell you about PyWeek um, and the game we're developing this, uh, this week, actually. If you see here, September 2022, the Red Plan Challenge is underway, and it's eight hours and 70 minutes to go. So if you want to quickly develop a game in the next eight hours and you don't have anything else to do, you can still do that today. Uh, the next challenge is going to be uh, in March 2023, I guess. So it's always two times a year. Um, show of hands, who knows what PyWig is? Okay, some of you, some of you. Uh, who has already participated in PyWig at some point? Okay, a few, nice. Who has participated in this Pi Week? Okay, great. So, task to do for next time, go and participate. And maybe after this lightning talk, you will. So, again, Pi Week is a biannual game challenge. Uh, it's all online, happens all online. Uh, and the point is, you basically create a game in one week with, you can use existing libraries like Pi Game or something else, but you're not allowed to use any code that you haven't published before because the idea is that everybody starts at the same page, more or less. Um, intended to be challenging and fun, so there is some rating and so on, so you can like vote uh, which games you like best in different categories and so on. But yeah, the point is having fun, creating games in Python, maybe learning Python by creating games and so on. Uh, there are a few rules that you have to follow. Um, you can either do an individual, individual uh, entry, which means that you do it all by yourself, uh, or you can have a team-based one, which means with some friends and so on, and that's actually what we do, did this time with the uh, Python user group in Vienna. Uh, we had a team challenge, and I'm going to show you the game really soon now. Um, then you have to write it from scratch, so you can use existing libraries, but basically you have to write everything from scratch uh, that's related to the game. So you cannot like create something for the game, except if you publish it, I think something like 30 days before the challenge starts. Um, one week, which is nice, because that means that um, you um, don't waste uh, too much time if it doesn't work out, so one week. And the theme is selected by voting and so on. You can read all the rest and so on. The challenge this September is The Red Planet. And uh, so basically, you have to create a game that's somehow related to that. Uh, it doesn't really have to be 
like very serious and so on, for example, we chose the topic the red planted, uh, like in plants, uh, for our entry. The initial discussion looked something like that. So that's like the first draft we did in uh, on, on Sunday or Saturday, like we're going to do something like with plants and, and flies and so on. Had lots of ideas and we threw lots of those ideas away, basically. And so we ended up at like six, that six days ago this week uh, creating the, the game and so on. Um, that's how it looked uh, on Monday, I think. Then we added some plant stuff there. Uh, we went ahead and decided to have different like areas. So some are uh, more fertile than others. So there's looks like that. Uh, and then we wanted to do something with the, the topic, which is uh, like red planet. So we made a planet, looked a bit weird, uh, iterated over it, made the plants actually on the planet and so on and so forth. Um, until eventually we tried something super weird, uh, which didn't work out. We tried to make it super realistic, which looked super ugly. So we reverted back to uh, a more pixel art comic style and just something like that here. Uh, different cursor artwork um, and yeah, went from the initial one that's here in the center to the ugly one here and then to something that's hopefully a bit more balanced. Um, yeah, there are of course some bug when you develop stuff. Um, too many items spawned, super weird. Uh, yeah, and then of course you iterate and iterate and it gets more fun. Uh, I got one more minute, so I'm going to skip over some of the things and I'm going to just show you the game. Um, that's the current state of the game as of this afternoon. So again, we call it Red Planted, which I guess still follows the rule of let Red Planet somehow. Uh, you basically uh, can look at the instructions, which is super small to read here, but yeah, you can do only so much in one week and then you play the game. You get a little backstory. Um, so basically command gardener and you uh, have to defeat your planet for the space flies. Uh, you can either squash them or yeah, if they, if they go away with your tomatoes, then it's game over. I'm skipping over those parts. And of course, the problem is while developing, that's really slow and I only have 20 seconds left. So of course, there's a dash dash fast mode for debugging. <laughs> so you go in there and then of course, they sprout very quickly. Uh, there's also audio, by the way, which I think kind of works. So there's basically just the space flies over there. And yeah, check it out. So I'm assuming everybody knows, okay. So let's play a game. Uh, in my job, I have to connect to with a lot of APIs. So let's say I provide the wrong credentials. Which HTTP code do you think, uh, do you think I should get back? Yeah? Okay. True. Okay, let's play another game. Which, if you don't count 403 or 401, and you don't count the 300 and 100 uh, one. Which five codes do you think I got from multiple APIs for getting the wrong credentials? 200. Yeah, that's one. 500, 500 was also correct. Hmm? 503 I also got. 404 surprisingly I never got, but that would be interesting to hear a case when that happened. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, there's still two left. I also didn't get that one. I would also be interested in that case. Also didn't get that one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think it was 490. Uh, was it correct? 18. I got 18 for not, uh, permissions not being correct, not for wrong credentials. Even though it's weird because teapot and coffee making doesn't have anything to do with credentials. Um, so yeah, uh, my point, uh, but here you can start to see that the guessing sort of started happening going in the, uh, in the random directions. And the point that I wanted to make for the users of the API, if you're creating them, please make sure to have uh, used a correct HTTP code because these uh, type of errors are really, really annoying to the back. And that was my entire point. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, yesterday, uh, Miro had his talk and he's coming after this one. So I thought it would be 
fair to insert myself before his talk because last time or yesterday he said that his first talk was the lightning talk at EuroPython. So I want to talk a bit about EuroPython. Who in the audience knows what EuroPython is? Okay, lots of people. Who ever been to EuroPython before? Okay, great. So for those who don't know, the EuroPython is a conference. It's kind of like this one because it's about Python. It's uh, Europe. Um, <laughs> Normally, when I do those uh, those lightning talks, I do them to announce where the next EuroPython is going to be. But this year, we already had a conference. It was in Dublin. If you haven't been there or haven't seen it, you can go to the website and catch up with the live streams and with the pictures and the, all the amazing keynotes and, and everything. Um, but we don't have the location for the EuroPython 2023 yet. So what I can share or announce today is what we published about an hour ago which is the community call for venues. Normally, the finding the location for the EuroPython is a, is a long and complicated process, and part of that process is asking the community where the community wants the EuroPython to go, and that's what this blog post is about. You can go to blog.europython.eu um, to read the, all the details and see all the timelines, uh, but I'm gonna give you a, a TLDR. If you have an idea where the EuroPython should go in 2023 and beyond, you can go read it and, and fill in the form. If you know anyone who would be interested in, uh, in, um, in proposing locations, you can also share it, tweet it out. Uh, you can retweet our tweet from earlier today. And uh, yeah, one more thing that I would like to mention is that EuroPython is a community organized conference. It's organized by EuroPython Society. That's the NGO based in Sweden. And all the profits that uh, are generated from the conference are going to the EuroPython Society grant program, which is later, later used to support conferences all over Europe, uh, including this one. We're a community partner of the Python Slovakia. Uh, we really like the conference, and we also really like the educational projects that you guys are doing here. And uh, if you have any other ideas of where that money from the grant program could go, either to a conference or to other Python project that you're doing somewhere in Europe, um, please send us an email to board at europython.eu and we'll be happy to help. And now on to Neurostock. I have a secret tip, but I don't see any organizers from PyCon SK. Maybe Europython in Bratislava wouldn't be such a bad idea. Okay, I will be quick because everyone is already hungry and uh, we want to go to the dinner somewhere. Um, my title of my lightning talk is on inches and feet. So about this imperial metric no, imperial measurement uh, system. Well, I'm completely for metric system and uh, my uh, I use metric system everywhere I can. Uh, my day, my week starts on Monday. Uh, my uh, clock has uh, 24 hours. And uh, so I try to, or I use it uh, when I need some data as much as possible. But sometimes it is practical to have some unit for measurement with you. And these are like inches or feet or some other lengths of your body. And since we are already all grown up, we, in most cases, we don't grow so much. And we know that, for example, one inch, inch how much is it? Like 2.5 centimeters. And for example, this, when I stretch my hand, this is almost exactly 23 centimeters. Well, with the foot is a little bit difficult because the uh, the shoes uh, are of different length that I use, so there is more or less one centimeter. But, well, if I need to measure some distance, this works quite well. So if, how much time did, do I have? So when I do one, well, let's take the longer one. So it's like one and two and three, a little bit more. So it would be like 80 centimeters maybe. But when I already start like counting and measuring it and I say like, okay, now I am at 10 and I do a line here and then go back, like subtract uh, five inches and then add again five inches, then most probably I will not land at the same line because, well, depends on how I press the inch. And well, my inch is not 2.24. It is, according, depending on how I press it, it is sometimes one millimeter less, one millimeter more. So it's approximately. And now we are moving to the programming mm, topic and these are the floats. Actually, everything that you use in physics, these are floats, and these are not exact. So even if I calculate that 80 centimeters uh, should be something like uh, uh, 8 times 4, 32 inches, uh, then it will be not exactly 32 inches, and each time I measure, it will be a little bit different. And when I add and subtract, add and subtract, I can 
like plus five, minus five, plus five, minus five. After one million iterations, I can land like, like 200 meters uh, far, uh, further away from there. So if in programming you do anything with physics, then use floats. But if you don't use physics and you have some exact numbers, then use integers, please. One hour has 3,600 uh, 3, seconds, not 3,600.0 seconds. Do it in your code, make the code legible, so use the numbers as they are, don't convert them to floats. We are not using Python 2 anymore. If you are dividing the number of seconds and you want to have the number of uh, hours, you don't need to write into your code like float of uh, 3,600 3, because uh, otherwise you would get some integer division. In Python 3, you can put exactly the uh, integer value for the stuff that it represents. And that's all. I'm looking forward to so many diffs and so many fixed code uh, on GitHub. Thank you very much. Mikrobit je programovateľný milý počítač, ktorý ti dovolí prepojiť informatiku s kreativitou. Dá sa programovať veľmi jednoducho a ovládať tak, aby robil presne to, čo chceš. O pár minút sme zvládli rozsvietiť vlastný obrázok na displeji a o chvíľu sme už obrázky diálkovo prepínali druhým mikrobitom. Mikrobit má v sebe aj super vychytávky, ako sú tlačidlá, senzor pohybu, kompas a teplomé. K mikrobitu ale môžeš pripojiť množstvo ďalších vecí. Tu programujeme, aká animácia sa nám má ukázať na LED pásiku. Ja som na ňom naprogramovala dúhu. Teraz programujeme podľa nôd kohútika Jarabého. Najlepšie na mikrobite je, že si viem vytvoriť napríklad blikajúceho robota alebo gitaru, ktorú ovládam tak, že ňou zatraciem, alebo futbalovú bránku, kde mi mikrobit počíta, koľko gólov som dala, alebo kúlové svietiace topánky a tisíc ďalších vecí, ktoré ešte len vymyslím. Mikrobit je hračka, ktorú schováš do dlane a vytvoríš z nej čokoľvek. Tak čo s ňou spravíš ty? Každých 60 sekúnd si 28 tisíc ľudí predplatí službu Netflix. Odošle sa 197 miliónov e-mailov, stiahne sa 414 tisíc aplikácií a ukradne niekoľko tisíc hesiel. Na internete sa toho deje veľa. A všetko najdôležitejšie sa dozviete na Živé SK. Živé SK. Technológie ľudskou rečou.